I realized that if you look at, for example, a blade of grass, and actually the whole history of life on Earth is written into that blade of grass. Like we share a common ancestor with that blade of grass. You know, this thing, this comet, the Atlas 3i comet that's going through at the moment, a fascinating thing. And yet you see people going, oh, it's aliens. The, the reality of it, that this is something that formed before the Earth formed and, and is visiting our solar system and going back out into interstellar space is more interesting than trying to say that it's some kind of complete useless if it's an alien spaceship there's a thing called the fermi paradox yes we now know there's so many planets out there so let's say trillions of planets in the milky way the milky way's been there for over 13 billion years pretty much the age of the universe if there's no one else out there then the question is why because there's been so much time and so many places for civilizations to become space faring civilizations right the idea of black holes goes back a long way actually back into the 1780s and 1790s there were two these are nine of the most mind-boggling facts explained by Professor Brian Cox. So stick around because I promise you won't want to miss a few of these. The idea of black holes goes back a long way, actually, back into the 1780s and 1790s. There were, there were two physicists, mathematicians, natural philosophers, whatever you want to call them, working at the time, that had the same idea apparently independently of each other. One was a clergyman, an English clergyman called Mitchell, and the other was the great French mathematician Laplace. And they were both thinking in terms of an idea called escape velocity. So the escape velocity is the speed you have to travel to completely escape the gravitational pull of something, a planet or a star. For the Earth, for example, the escape velocity from the surface of the Earth is around 8 miles a second, 11 kilometers a second. What Mitchell and Laplace thought, and I think it's a very beautiful idea, is they imagined in their mind's eye, well, can you go bigger? Can you imagine more and more massive stars, giant stars, such that the gravitational pull is so large at the surface that the escape velocity exceeds the speed of light? There's a wonderful quote, actually, in Laplace's paper, where he says that the largest objects in the universe may go unseen by reason of their magnitude. And this is back in the 1780s or 1790s. So he's imagining stars where the gravitational pull is so vast that even light can't escape and you couldn't see it. Dark stars, I think he referred to them as. Now, now we know that such objects do not exist in the universe in that sense in the sense that Mitchell and Laplace meant. But actually, they miss something, which is not surprising because it sounds almost paradoxical. But you can also increase the escape velocity, the surface of an object, by squashing it. And it turns out that if you take the Earth and you squash it down and squash it down and squash it down until it's about that big, the radius just less than a centimetre, then the gravitational pull at the surface would be so great that light couldn't escape. And that is essentially the modern concept of a black hole. If probability favours the existence of aliens, why haven't we observed any? What you mean by probability favours the existence of aliens, I, I guess you mean, and I'd agree with you, that the universe is so big. I mean, we just said that there is something like one with 22 noughts after its stars in the observable universe. We now know that most of those um, have planetary systems. Certainly, if you look in the Milky Way, which we can do in our own galaxy, basically everywhere we look, we find planets around the stars. So let's say that most of them have solar systems. So it is inconceivable that there will not be life and I think civilizations out there amongst the stars. But the question becomes, first of all, what form does that life take? So in the solar system, we know there's only one place, Earth, which has complex life. It could well be that there are microbes below the surface on Mars today, or there may have been microbes on Mars in the past when Mars had rivers and lakes and quite possibly oceans. So there could have been Martians, but there would have been little microbes or bacteria-like things uh, at best, I think. On the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, like Europa, there are oceans below the surface, and we think the conditions are right for life to have started. If there are aliens in our solar system, there'll be little single-celled things waiting for us to find them. But if you mean aliens in spaceships, that means civilizations. And um, we don't know, we've looked a bit, we've listened for radio signals from other stars, we've found nothing. We have no evidence of alien civilizations at all. That might mean we haven't looked hard enough because we haven't looked particularly hard, the galaxy is very big. But it might also mean that civilizations are rare. But biologists say, well, but if you look at life on Earth, it took four billion years, let's say, 
to go from the origin of life to a civilization, which is about a third of the age of the universe. And if you start to say, well, if, if that's typical and we don't know, then it may be that there are very few solar systems and planets and stars that are stable enough for that long to allow the evolution to do its work. And, I mean, you think about it, there are clever things on Earth besides humans, dolphins, for example. But dolphins are not going to build spaceships because they can't have any electricity because they live in the sea. And so, you know, it can, it could be that quite typically, if things with big brains tend to be under the water, then they're never going to build radio telescopes and spaceships. You know, this thing, this comet, when we will talk about it, the Atlas 3i comet that's going through at the moment, a fascinating thing that maybe what current estimates, maybe seven, eight billion years old that has come from a distant star system mm -hmm. an unprecedented opportunity to observe material that's coming from a distant star system and yet you see people going oh, it's aliens the the reality of it that this is something that formed before the earth formed right and, and is visiting our solar system and going back out into interstellar space is more interesting than trying to say that it's some kind of completely useless by the way if it's an alien spaceship it's not spending much time it misses the earth by what is it the nearly two astronomical units right. Right. It goes flying through the solar system, flying off again. It's been traveling for something like probably about 7 billion years or something like this. Can you imagine if right. anyone is and sat missed, in that And you missed your exit. Going, oh, no. 7 you billion know, years. Uh, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go around again. <laughs> we'll make a course correction and go around again. I'm sure it'll be fine. Not much will have changed in, in 7 billion years. If you go back to the 17th century, 16th century, 18th century, Large Hadron Collider or the Apollo program of the time was to try to measure the distance initially from the Earth to the Sun. That was done in a, in a very subtle and clever way by watching something called the transit of Venus, when the Venus floats across the face of the Sun. And by watching it from different positions on the Earth, you can do some geometry and they were very smart and they figured out they could use this to find the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Once you have that, you use parallax, believe it or not, to get mm -hmm. the distance to the nearest stars. So parallax is, you know, with your eyes, if you, if, you, if you close one eye and then close the other eye and something moves, right? No so way! You see that it moves. Yeah. It's because of the distance between your eyes. Uh, and yeah. so, so you close one, you close the other, and the angles change a bit and you can see how far something is away. And Amazing. that's how you perceive depth to some extent. If you know the distance from the Earth to the Sun, then you can look at the position of a star in the sky in, let's say, January, and then look at it in July. And you've gone halfway around the Sun. So your eyes, in that case, are twice the distance from the Earth to the Sun. And you see the star shift a bit because it's just the same as doing that. And that's how you do the distance to the nearest stars. Mm -hmm. And then from then, what happens is you try to find some relationship between the brightness of a star and something else that it does. Mm -hmm. And that there are things called variable stars, which, which vary. So they go light and dark and light and dark, and they vary in a way that's proportional to how bright they actually are. And so if you know how bright something is, actually, and you know how bright it looks, then you can guess how, or, or calculate how far away it is, right? Because the further away it is, the dimmer it is. So that's another way of doing it. Then we have things called the Type 1a supernova explosions, which are mm -hmm. very bright, and we know how bright they actually are, and we can see them in distant galaxies, and that allows us to tell how far away the galaxies are. Then finally, which goes to the end of your question, you find that if you look at very distant galaxies, then the light from them is stretched, it means it goes redder, because longer wavelength light is redder. It's called redshift. And you find that the further away the galaxy is, the more stretched the light is. So right. it's a direct measurement you can make. And that tells you how fast the universe is expanding. Because what's happened is the light has been traveling across space for, you can see them out to 10 billion years or something like that. And it means that the light has been traveling for 10 billion years across the universe. And if it's stretched by like, say a factor of three, then it tells you the universe a stretch by a factor of three during that time. So that allows you to measure the expansion rate of the universe. And if you know how fast it's expanding at all these different times, then you can wind it back using Einstein's theory, actually, right. to go, when was everything on top of each other? So it's, it's a whole thing that began back in the 1600s with these missions around the world on sailing ships. So it's a story that spans centuries, this idea that people just wanted to measure. If you take an infinite number of monkeys and give them the typewriters, they'll type out 
Shakespeare, yeah, the works of Shakespeare. True. Is that Thank true? You. They're you monkeys. Don't. You don't think? No, no. no <laughs> They're still you monkeys. Were, you were talking to me earlier about infinity. You know I know, but if you get an infinite number of monkeys, aren't they the same exact animal? They're going to type the exact works of Shakespeare. That they will, because there's an infinite number of them. So every possible combination <laughs> of letter presses must happen. If you've got an infinite number of them, and you've, then you will get everything that can possibly happen will happen if the universe <laughs> is infinite, which it may well be. In fact, the, there are many ways the universe can be infinite then that would happen. If it's in accord with the laws of physics, then it can happen. And everything that can happen in an infinite universe will happen because the universe is formally infinite. It, even the most unlikely possibility must happen. In fact, formally, an infinite number of times. So maybe Shakespeare was yeah, a monkey. actually just looking. Yeah. A supernova in our galaxy happened on average once every 100 years. The most famous one happened in 1054 AD. This is a picture of it today called the Crab Nebula. You can see it with a small telescope in the sky. It's a beautiful cloud of expanding gas. So this is a star that's died and exploded. 1054 AD, it exploded. Exploded. How do we know that? Because it was observed by Chinese astronomers and particularly interesting, I think, and it's one place that I had the pleasure of visiting in one of my TV programs, is this place. It's called Chaco Canyon, which is in the southwestern United States, very close to the Mexican border. There was a civilization here a thousand years ago that built structures like this, enormous castles and houses in the desert. Many of these civilizations were extremely sophisticated and built these giant structures that are still there in the desert. This is in New Mexico. Mexico, Chaco Canyon. And these people, this is a picture of me, of course, but what's fascinating is not me, because these people saw that explosion in 1054, we strongly believe. And this is a painting of the explosion, the supernova. Now this was 6,000 light years away, which is a, a star a long way away from us. But this is a, a, a a drawing of the crescent moon. Uh, this is a drawing of a new star that appeared glowing as brightly as the moon. And it's thought that this handprint points to a place in the sky. And you find that indeed, that supernova would have happened next to the moon in exactly that place. At that point in the sky, it would have glowed as brightly, shone as brightly as the moon, and the moon was in that shape, that crescent. It's a beautiful piece of detective work that tells us that these people, a thousand years ago, observed a new star shining brightly in the sky for two weeks, the crab supernova over explosion. There's a thing called the Fermi paradox. Yes. We now know, we didn't when Fermi first posed it, by the way, we now know there's so many planets out there. So let's say trillions of planets in the Milky Way. The Milky Way's been there for over 13 billion years, pretty much the age of the universe. If there's no one else out there, then the question is why? Because there's been so much time and so many places for civilizations to become space-faring civilizations. Right. You know, as, as Elon talks about, multi-planetary civilization, we, we're very close to becoming a multi-planetary civilization. And once you have become a multi-planetary and multi-stellar civilization, if you become that, you're immortal, basically, essentially. Mm, right. So the question is, the paradox is, why does it appear nobody has done that? So the first thing to say is, I, I would not be surprised. Right, if a UFO landed here now in the parking lot, I'd actually, not only would I not be surprised, I'd be relieved, actually. Because it'd be a weight off my shoulders, because I'm worried right. that, we're the, only that ones. we're the only ones. And we're going to make a mess of it. Let's assume, just for the purposes of this, that we're the only ones in, in, in yeah. our galaxy, let's say, then I would argue that meaning, right, what it mean, that whatever it is, it self-evidently exists because the universe means something to us. I would argue that it's a property of complex biological systems. So it, whatever it is, it's something that emerges, in this case, from human brains. So I would argue that if this planet is the only planet in our galaxy where complex biological systems exist, then it follows. It's the only place where meaning currently exists in a galaxy of 400 billion suns. Let's imagine that we continue for a million years or a billion years as a civilization. It is possible that life can get so advanced in the universe that it can start to manipulate the universe itself. But imagine life gets so advanced that it can start to change the destiny of a star. Then the evolution of stars would, life would matter in the sense that it could start to change the way that the universe behaves on a large scale in the future. And so it's 
it reminded me actually is another great book by John Barrow and Frank Tipler called The Anthropic Cosmological Principle from the 1980s. It's one of my favourite books actually and I remembered it and in there they speculate about this life in the far, far future and if it became powerful enough to manipulate the whole universe or the observable universe mm. then suddenly you it's can't got... make predictions about the far future yeah. unless you consider the possible impact of life on the universe. It must sound to many people listening just nonsense, right? Science fiction. But if you think our civilization has been around for, what, 10,000 years at best, really, give or take. And in that time, we've sent stuff out of the solar system. Although we don't yet, we're way away from being able to manipulate stars, we can manipulate planets. So we, we are changing the way this planet operates. Life has changed it. The oxygen in the atmosphere is a product of life. So life already we know changes planets. I like that speculation that just possibly it's not just a temporary little phenomena that flickers in and out and then disappears again. It could have a, a real bearing on the future of the universe. I realise that if you look at, for example, a blade of grass, and actually the whole history of life on Earth is written into that blade of grass. Like we share a common ancestor with that blade of grass. Mm. There's a single origin to life, the last universal common ancestor called mm. Luca, which is back there about 3.8 billion years ago, we think. What you should see there is, is an organism that's essentially four-dimensional, right? The structure of it mm. cannot be understood without understanding the history of a planet. And, and that's what science does for you. It makes it even more beautiful. So it's a beautiful thing in itself. But the more you know about how it got there and what it represents and its story, the more beautiful it becomes. So that's not, that's emotional. Mm. It's an emotional reaction to the thing. So you should have an emotional reaction to a blade of grass because it encodes the history of a planet.